Welcome and to our webinar, Maintaining Empathy in, our, in an Era of Claims Automation. So the topic for today's webinar builds on the discussion we recently held in our Touchless Claims webinar where we highlighted how carriers are making use of end-to-end -end claims automation. But as this industry trend gains momentum, we must not forget the importance of maintaining empathy and providing a personal touch when customers have suffered a loss. In today's webinar, we will discuss the challenges of automating customer engagement during the claims process and the steps carriers can take to capture the value of automation while not sacrificing the customer experience and overall satisfaction. Now, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items for you on the phone. If you have a question for our speakers today, please use the Ask a Question feature on your screen at any point and we will respond to those questions during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. On your screen, you will also see an option called Vote. This is our live polling feature, which we will use in this webinar to get your thoughts on subjects related to the content. We've already activated the first poll of the webinar, so feel free to start voting now. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers today. My name is Gian Kalbesberg, and, I'm a, and I will be moderating today's conversation. As a member of Duck Creek's product marketing team, I have the opportunity to bring together and work with different subject matter experts within our company and across the industry to develop and deliver thought-provoking ideas that help carriers run their business. For that reason, I'm really excited to introduce Sasha Coral and Tara Kelly, who have really great insights to share about creating empathy and claims. Sasha is Duck Creek's principal product manager for the Duck Creek Claims product with responsibility for defining the R&D initiatives for the claims product. In that capacity, Sasha works with Duck Creek claims customers across different claims department sizes and lines of business to understand technology priorities. She also works with industry analysts and technology vendors to bring the latest in technology to the PNC claims place through the Duck Creek Claims platform. She offers a perspective on the claims technology agenda and challenges over that diverse set of published author and founder of Splice Software, and she is passionate about technology's potential to change lives for the better. She has consistently channeled that belief into developing technologies that enhance operations, enable better service delivery, and improve the customer experience to achieve her goal of creating a healthy and humane work environment. Now, before we start the discussion with Sasha and Tara, we'd like to get a sense of what's on your mind and start with the poll question. So our first poll question asks, which of these aspects of customer engagement would you consider the most challenging? Is it providing customers with access and transparency to information? Facilitating conversations with customers? delivering the right message at the right time, or retaining customers at their claims. Okay, I'm seeing several of you have already voted, um, but we'll continue to give some time for the rest. Okay, we're, we're getting a really good distribution of responses, and I see the majority indicating that well, it's split between delivering the right message at the right time and providing customers with access to transparency to information. Those two are, are, are the most challenging uh, from what we're hearing from the audience. So as you can tell from the results, there are a lot of reasons why building strong relationships with customers can be difficult. So uh, but before we get into the, the root causes of those issues, I'd like to bring Sasha and Tara into the conversation to speak into the value of automating um, engagement and how it impacts the three aspects of claims. So to start, Sasha, can you give us a broad sense of the goals carriers are trying to achieve by automating customer engagement? Sure. Uh, sure, Jan. I can talk about what is automating customer engagement. So. Um, at, at its core, customer engagement is communicating with the customer. Um, I'll share one example of, of automating customer engagement at a very basic level. 
Um, in our last webinar, we talked about straight through processing for claims and we shared an overall workflow for how to enable that. A core enablement of that is automating communication at points where there's a status update about the claim. Uh, so as an example, when a payment was sent out, um, we utilized Splice software to send out an automated communication to the customer in their preferred communication mechanism to let them know that they should be receiving the payment soon. Um, that's a very basic example. Uh, there are other examples. So for example, uh, if a customer submits a photo uh, to estimate damages, you can do photo-based estimating um, manually, or you can employ machine learning um, and more advanced technologies to try to automate uh, damage estimation off of a photo that was submitted. So there's varying, varying degrees of um, how much you can automate, but ultimately with customer engagement at the heart, um, I, see, I see two different um, values that carriers are striving towards when they're looking at customer engagement initiatives. Um, some carriers are a little bit more efficiency focused and that's carried by an operational efficiency goal. So um, a, core example there is traditionally carriers looking to provide self-service options for customers in order to reduce the number of income, incoming calls. Status updates on repairs in order to reduce inquiry calls to, to the operation. So that's driven by operational efficiency and that's an example of a carrier looking to automate customer engagement for the goal of reducing um, manual work within uh, the claims department. More and more today, I do see a lot more carriers focused on the customer satisfaction aspect of customer engagement. Um, so consumers today do have a high degree of expectation with regards to communication, transparency, different types of services being offered for um, how to get status updates and how to provide information to the carrier. Uh, so there are quite a few carriers that are starting to focus more and more on the customer agenda and putting customer satisfaction at the center of their goals when talking about customer engagement and automating it. Thanks, Sasha. Um, Tara, what are, you, what are your customers telling you about the goals that they're trying to achieve? Yeah, I think the number one thing we continue to consistently hear in market is, you know, customer satisfaction. We want to work on, you know, engaging more with our customers. Um, I think there is, you know, a massive um, need to ensure that we are where our customer is. And as we look at the mobile lifestyle and uh, expectations and what our consumers can get from, you know, an online brand when they're buying a jacket or reordering some Tide pods or whatever that might be. Um, these are the experiences they've come to expect. And so, I, you know, I love Sasha's examples. And, um, you know, if you unpack, for example, photo submission even further, um, does that mean that they're going online and logging into your platform from a traditional PC and uploading a photo? Um, or does that mean that you're allowing them to send a photo in, um, you know, back in an SMS chain um, where you've previously communicated with them? Where, where are you making these options present, and I think um, as we look at the question, well, what is satisfying, right? What is satisfying to that customer, um, and what does it mean to have empathy in that process? Um, automation works wonderful when it feels like it's an added advantage. Um, and the part that's fantastic about that is that you save money and they have a better experience. And so I, I think when we look at this, you know, triangle, it's just a perfect thing to keep in mind. And I, and I think a lot of us do. Uh, it's always sort of our goal. But um, it's the opportunity for the triple win. And I think that's the part that we just don't want to, you know, get lost with is that, Operational efficiency is only actually efficient if if people really engage and it satisfies them and and it feels right and when all those things happen um, there's going to be a fantastic cost savings and um, we'll we'll get into this more and come back to what does that mean we say there's this cost savings or that claims are processed faster but you know can we report on these things. So um, I love the tension and the relationship um, and the opportunity for a triple win as we look at sort of these primary factors. Those are great points about the value of automation, um, but at the same time, we hear from carriers that they need to maintain empathy throughout the process, especially as we're disrupting the process with um, technology, new technologies. Um, so, so Tara, can you help us understand why the challenges we raised in our poll question exist and what it means to be empathetic uh, even as more automation is introduced into the claims process? 
Yeah, and I think as we look at, you know, what is it to be empathetic, how do we ensure that it feels as we offer more automation, that it, we're not just trying to automate our lives for efficiency and cost savings, but we're actually doing it with the customer's best interest at, at, at heart, and how do we make sure that's genuine in the DNA of the organization? And, you know, there's been some large brands in the last few years that have said, we're not even going to have, you know, a customer satisfaction or customer focus anymore because every employee is going to have customer focus. It's not just going to be a department called customer engagement. It's, it's actually going to be a way of life. It's going to be part of our DNA. And I think you look at timeliness. Um, that in itself tells me I care because I'm making sure I get this to you as fast as possible. And I'm creating um, some empathy by ensuring that it's going out to you in the right language, in the right tone, um, that I'm offering you an option to chat with me um, in the middle of the night, right, um, with, with a bot or, or a human, right, um, that I'm, I'm really creating the capacity to totally understand to the best of my ability where you are and how we're going to work through this process. Um, so when we look at the claims process, um, it's you and this other party are going to go on this journey together and you want to be seen as that empathetic guide. Um, and so having warmth and, and ensuring that the customer actually feels special and that um, to, the, to the polling questions, and it's interesting to see, you know, a perfect split because I think this is a question that's, you know, asked frequently. It is about timing. If you don't get the message to someone in a timely way, that just doesn't seem very caring. Um, and, and, you know, you know, direct mail is probably not your best bet, but you have to recognize first notice of loss. So, so what do you do? Um, and being transparent, being as transparent as possible. You know, you see catastrophic events, and you can't get back to everybody and evaluate everybody's roof and siding in the same day. It's not possible. But are you communicating, and are you being transparent about the best that is available? So um, I think it's just being responsive and, and understanding the need to be diligent um, with the right messages at the right time and having automation that actually helps you be more empathetic and more there for your customer. Now, yeah, I, 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 I like how you I was gonna say I like how Tara you pulled out all these these words from the screen. Sasha, do you have some thoughts on the words on the screen and how they relate to claims? Yeah, and just to, to react a little bit to what uh, Tara has shared, I think it's critical, uh, the points, Tara, that you've raised in terms of timeliness, um, and in terms of doing what's at the customer's best interest of, at heart. Um, timeliness is important and critical uh, in terms of empathy, right? At least getting a, an acknowledgement of a receipt of a question or a need. Um, so that responsiveness and the right messages, as you explained, Tara, are critical. And especially at high volume times in a, in a claims department, automation is truly the only way or the most um, ideal way to deliver on that empathetic need of timeliness. So. I think um, when, one of the things I hear most common from carriers is um, there's, there's almost a fear around automation um, because of the cost to empathy. Um, so as an example of that, when we share our point of view on how to fully automate a claims process, which begins by um, automatically receiving FNOL from a telematics device, um, the first question I get from claims leaders is, do you really automate FNOL? Um, where's the empathy in that? Uh, so, so I do get questions like that, and that is generally how automation is regarded. And I, th I think it's very important to recognize everything that Tara shared, which is, hey, responsiveness is key. Timeliness of communication is priority. And that is how you deliver on, on an empathetic experience in today's world. And so how do you enable that? It's actually through automation in the right points. And then secondly, you know, having the customer's best interest at heart and tailoring the experience for, uh, for what you know about your customers is very important. And this is where um, one of the things that we focus on a lot at Duck Creek can talk a lot about is customer, ex customer awareness, um, user experience research, knowing what matters to your customer. Um, that can be captured during the time of a claim, for example, or at any point in communicating with the customer. Uh, but knowing whether your customer wants to have automated messages is important in informing whether or not you're tailoring your communications appropriately. So to share an example, um, I once spoke to an agent who um, worked for a top tier insurance company. Uh, and he shared with me, my carrier has uh, 
helped me by automating um, outgoing calls to my entire book of business in preparation for catastrophe. And while that sounds great, one of my longest time customers called me up who has been with me for over 30 years and said, why is this robot calling me? I expect you to call me. What's going on? So trust was a factor and agent communication was the top priority for that customer. On the flip side, at the same company and carrier, a different customer called into the claims department and said, guys, I'm getting paper letters from you. I don't want paper in my inbox at home. I want you to just send me all digital communications. Now there's an aspect of reality and legality there of what you can and cannot deliver digitally and what you have to provide by paper, but the awareness of the different customers you have in your book of business and what the ideal approach is to providing that experience um, while also bolstering your capabilities from an automation standpoint to be as timely, communicative, and responsive as possible. Those are all the things that I hear about um, as critical points of focus for em empathy in the claims process. Yeah, I mean, so from what I hear, you know, reassuring customers and accommodating their needs is, is critical to, sh to showing empathy. Uh, but we know those needs are evolving with technology and, and along with technology, and that's reshaping the relationships between carriers and, and customers. So my, my next question is to Sasha. In, in this era of automation, where do you see customer engagement today, and, and what kind of customer engagement strategies do, do you see in the future? So I hear different, um, different degrees of evolution here. Uh, first of all, strategically, um, how important is customer centricity to an organization? I would say over the last five years that has evolved and customers are becoming more of a focus. Um, some carriers it has always been the top and only priority for a carrier, customer experience. Um, and that's what they build, build their brand on. Um, but then other carriers are starting to focus more on customer centricity and customer loyalty and delivering um, and focusing on initiatives entirely around the customer. So I think strategically um, it's evolving uh, in terms of focus for carriers. And then also technologically what that means uh, in terms of providing good customer service, providing um, the proper mechanisms for communicating with your customer. What that meant five years ago um, being able to send an email, what that means today, plugging into social media and all aspects of digital, um, those are two very different things. So so I do see an evolution overall in terms of this gaining critical mass and importance to carriers as well as um, an evolution in delivering this goal with as well. Yeah, I I really love I love this graph and I think um, you know, we start at the bottom here and, and you look at maintaining a pulse on customers and there was a time not that long ago, right, that it was enough in the you know, for your technology just to be able to tell you, hey, they were just online, um, you know, clicking around on our Q and A page and now they're calling into the call center and that was, you know, a fantastic win. We could just have a pulse. Uh, what was the last thing we did with this customer? Was it, you know, send them a letter or talk to them or what what was that? And I think um, as we move through this value chain uh, almost as it you know it almost is as we look at these evolving engagement strategies uh, you look at what is personalized communication and Sasha talked to that earlier and it, it is so important to understand that preferences are real <laughs> and uh, I, I I did this years ago and I still think it's so true but I, 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 I talked about flowers and, and so just forgive me for a minute but you were dating somebody and um, and they asked you you know and, and they asked you what's your favorite flowers he said, you know what, and this is a true story for me, I love lilies, I hate roses, true story. So, uh, you know, oh, I love lilies, I love all lilies actually. Uh, and then a week later they brought you roses, you'd probably actually not think they were all that lovely, you would think, wow, what a big jerk, right? <laughs> like, it would be actually a negative. Um, but if a week before he had not asked and he just happened to bring me flowers and they happened to be roses, I would have just thought, oh, well, that's nice. He just doesn't know me that well yet. And, and we would have just been moving forward in our relationship. And so 
I bring this up because I think it's so important to to realize that you have to be ready to use the information that your customers provide. You have to be ready to actually have an automated, integrated process to support those preferences. And in if you're not fully ready, let's not make a preference base. Let's go with permission and start it in as many channels as you can do well. Um, and so these things are really important, and that's why you know the consultative nature and multi multi teams, uh, multi parties on a team bringing these initiatives forward are so important because. Because if you learn something about that customer that says, my gosh, I need you to personally call me and I want to have a conversation with you, as a, as a carrier and as a broker, you have a decision. If that is a value level that you can deliver on, then you want to make sure that guy is flagged, that he gets a personal call every time. And you actually have an automated DN process that DNCs out a list that says, don't auto call these people or auto text them. Let's call this guy personally. Here's the personal call list and out, out of print. And all of these things are very, very capable. And if we do those things, um, we're going to drive loyalty and we're going to drive a beautiful, connected customer loyalty. And so, um, you, you really have to ask yourself as, as you build out these strategies, um, you know, am I being true and, and genuine in this relationship? And, and that, that's where you start to see that, that holy grail of loyalty arrive. And I sort of, you know, look at a, another example in this. It doesn't, I, I, it doesn't always have to be, it doesn't always have to be perfect, but you need to start. You need to start somewhere and you need to start connecting those systems. And I think the advantage today, um, I, and again, Sasha talks to it as where are we from a technology perspective. Everybody has APIs. There's an application interface that you can connect with, right? You can share this data across multiple touch points. And in, in doing that, you can really take that loyalty to the next level. Um, and so I think it's a very, very exciting time um, to be working towards these strategies. There's lots of opportunity um, within that claims process starting at first notice of loss to not just be in the channel and blast at your customer, but to actually turn it into a conversation and, and start from a place of preference, um, and, 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 and that's where the loyalty will come from. So um, it's exciting. It's a very exciting time to be working on these engagement strategies. Uh, those are great points, and I, and I know we've drawn a straight hour here, but we know that customer needs and technology will continue to evolve. So, it, you know, especially as automation reduces person-to-person -person engagement. So it, this should probably look, look more like a loop than a straight line. But, uh, you know, moving, moving on. So once customers decided on an engagement strategy, let's talk about what success looks like. So Tara, can you talk about how automation has been used in different points in the claims process? And maybe start from FNOL, since that's the step where we see carriers have been putting a lot of effort today. Yeah, so for first notice of loss, this is a really tricky time. I think that uh, it's, it's one of the most critical, and that's where you hear that feedback to show the empathy um, and recognize this person, especially in you know property and casualty, and you, you're either out of a car or your you know your sink has wrecked your bathroom or your you know it may be worse your your whole siding or house flood and this is a very traumatic and upsetting time and so having that first notice of loss be incredibly timely uh, timely is so important and. And we look at some of the data that comes back, we you know, we go back to that triangle and say, you have to be able to report on it as well. Where's the win? Are customers happy? Are we saving money? Is it more efficient? Um, one, of my, one of my favorite stories is um, just on average, what we see is uh, we're shaving about three days off of that process by automating that first notice of loss call. And, um, and just by reaching them a little bit quicker um, and letting them know. And so what we do hear from a lot of carriers is that we don't always know immediately who the adjuster is going to be. Um, so that's fair, right? That happens. Um, but with automation, you can immediately respond and first recognize we understand you've had this loss and here's how we're going to manage this and you'll hear from us. Or um, if you have that information, you can text them that number or you can, you know, take a phone call that they say, you know, say yes and we'll text you your adjuster's number. Now it turns into a text. Now that text turns into a two-way chat. Now this person that's under a ton of distress and may not be able to immediately book the time with the adjuster has, a, has it on their phone, and you've turned it into such a mobile and easy, transparent way um, to go ahead and book that adjuster appointment, and now it's a two-way chat. And I, I love that example because it's a story about just being where your customer is and being responsive across 
across channels and mediums and just moving seamlessly um, versus having these, you know, siloed campaigns that can't communicate with each other. You really need to be able to move between chat, between SMS, between calls, between photo submissions, all on that same wonderful smart device. So we're so lucky to have them in, in, in everybody's hands. Uh, there's a lot available. Um, Photo submission is another really interesting one. Uh, I think if you get into the stories of the companies that have launched it, um, there's also a problem in photo submissions and that people take all these pictures, they send them in, and they think they're done, and they kind of just check out and say, like, you know, you know, you know, brush off their hands and say, okay, work done, I'll wait, it's, my check's coming. Um, but they're not always a quality enough photo to make that claim. Um, and so then now what? And waiting for them to log back into the platform is just not a great solution or sending them an email. This is definitely one of those times where you need to be able to text out or call out uh, wherever you have that consent and preference and get back to the customer. Um, and so with photo submissions, we've seen actually quite a big uptick in, in work where we're literally just messaging your photo we're not satisfactory, please resubmit. Um, we need this, this. And sending them out you know, a link and examples. And, having customers resend in those. And the results on this um, were amazing for me, actually. It was 32% faster, 32%. And I said, oh, okay, those are the people that had crappy pictures. And they said, no, that is of the entire photo submission group. Um, and so I think this story is interesting for a few reasons. Um, because it, it massively improved the process in an easy, measurable way. But the interesting thing is the thing the organization was reporting on is the speed of photo submission claims compared to sending out adjusters or taking them into shops. And that was the report that was easy and accessible for them to run. And I would argue, therefore, it was the right report to choose. And so is it interesting for us to know exactly the different photos that received photos compared to the ones that had to receive an email or wait till they got a notification on their phone from an app or their, their system, maybe that would be interesting, but not if it requires an entire other process of reporting um, because if you go back to the triangle, it kind of it kind of wrecks that other little dot, right? And so as we, as we look at these success stories, um, really capture the idea that we want to find the fastest, easiest reports that you care about the most today, and that's going to drive that greatest impact. So, um, you know, there's a ton, and I, I don't want to go on and on, but when we look at what does success look like today, it's when organizations really get started right at FNOL, and you create that automated, very timely response that's fluid and moves across the channels and is building conversation. Um, and the results are always pretty amazing as far as the financial savings, the time savings, claims closure, appointments that are being met, all of it. Um, it's, it's just really exciting to just look at the data, look at the reports, and know it's been successful. Sasha, yeah, you I'll try in here a little bit. Definitely. I definitely have some thoughts here. Uh, Tara, I think you've shared some amazing experiences there. Um, I love all the metrics that you've shared of experiences of success in the past, the 32% photo, photo faster resubmissions, shaving three days off the process. I think those are all key, and um, the heart of what I'm hearing you say, and I completely agree with, is being able to track the results back to the ROI for an initiative um, and back to customer satisfaction scores, claim cycle times, um, closure rates, uh, financial outcomes, etc. So I think that those are all critical. And I, I do see a great deal of success with uh, customer engagement leading the way there. I will share a little bit from uh, seeing how other carriers have, a, have attacked this <laughs> um, to say sometimes getting to the, that success isn't exactly the journey that you think it's going to be. Um, so don't necessarily let your present technology state hamper um, going into these initiatives. So I hear a lot of carriers say things like, I want to provide a digital capability for my customers, but my current claim platform um, does not support that. My technology project to get there would take XYZ amount of time. Um, and so uh, there, are, there are quite a few different claims departments out there that are feeling hampered by their technology and therefore not pursuing these initiatives that do drive great results. And some of the results that Tara shared, they're real. 
Um, so it's a worthwhile uh, journey. Um, I, I've seen one carrier tackle that in, in a very creative way, which is um, when they first looked to create customer self-service capabilities, uh, that they created a digital portal for a customer, um, a mobile app along with a responsive um, website. And they did not have a claims platform actually that was connected enough to be able to support seamless and, and back and forth dynamic handoff. And they did not want to invest in the cost and time uh, to upgrade their platform and get it to that point. So what they actually did is um, they created a temporary operational department within their claims department that manually re-entered claims into their legacy claim system based on everything that was happening in the digital portal. Um, that's probably not the end state of technology, but what that did do is enable the carrier to present real results and share ROI and be able to track the outcomes and the metrics uh, that Tara shared and to be able to get those results and learnings in a much faster way to bolster the business case to get their technology up to speed to be able to deliver that without that operational dependency and take that customer experience to the next level. So I think success is both the outcomes and the results you have in terms of those metrics in that claims triangle that we always historically have focused on. And it's also being able to get there quickly and being able to articulate those results in an informed manner. Those are great examples. Now, I think not just because they demonstrate the value, but the fact that results can be measured offers excellent be benchmarks for carriers who are considering to embark on this journey of automation. So for carriers who want to embark on this journey, the results you've discussed are important to understand, but, but so is the path to achieving them. So let's talk about that path. Uh, Sasha, you've worked with many carriers to build their vision for claims handling and customer engagement. What do you see is required from an implementation perspective? Yeah, so I like to talk about implementation in this space being um, a zigzag as opposed to a straight line. Um, it's not a project where you set out on, the, on an end goal that you know and deliver to that end goal in incremental project phases. It's a project that in, involves a lot of discovery. So testing and learning is, is critical uh, in terms of the approach for how you implement because um, the preferences you'll see from your customers, you may learn while you're implementing, right? Um, the uh, results that you see, you will learn while you're implementing. So it's important to be nimble and to be able to plan within your implementation to respond to what you're learning and um, address accordingly. There's a few different things that I think are critical to implementation um, to enable that. Um, one is clearly having the technology and the solutions like, for example, the spice of the world to be able to deliver engagement solutions for customers. Um, another, another key critical enablement is in order to enable test and learn uh, as you in weave those capabilities into your offerings for the customer. You have to be able to quickly deploy those technologies um, and isolate them to a user base if you want to do a test group. Um, and you have to be able to fail fast or succeed fast. Uh, so the learning aspect of test and learn, so having the reports or insights or somehow metrics to be able to respond to, and having, um, for, for us, we focus on codeless configuration, having a very quick approach to changing your business rules, changing the, the conditions under which you, you present specific specific automation activities, um, being able to deploy that in a rapid manner. Those are, those are the key enablers from, from my point of view is uh, testing, <laughs> putting in new things quickly, and then learning, seeing what happens with it, and adjusting accordingly. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think, uh, Sasha, we see that the test and learn, and it sounds easy. You can say it fast. Um, but it, it, it is hard. It is hard, I think, to watch, um, you know, organizations get ready to set up for that. And one of the things that I would, you know, call out in key implementation is having that, um, that team that is represented from everybody in the touch point. So having claims as well as call center as well as the adjusters and giving, giving everybody an opportunity to provide feedback um, throughout that process. Uh, so you're really able to capture everything. Um, we've certainly seen examples where 
where what will end up happening is by using um, smart caller ID and having every customer have the appropriate uh, number coming in on their phone, you can actually sometimes increase the call volume to the call center. And you think, wait, that's not the plan, <laughs> right? The call center has to be ready for that. Uh, what did they need to not do that, right? We, we've seen scenarios like that, and having that feedback quickly from the call center on day three is much better than waiting till two weeks in, right? Um, and having them in that discussion, and so we can start giving them more options and route them to a different part of an IVR or to route them um, to a different part of the, the organization or create a different opportunity within chat. Um, so there is always a way of, of learning and managing and trialing, um, but recognizing that as you move forward in this path, you're absolutely right. It's just it can't be a straight line. Um, and I think the other area too is realizing that you just can't you can't start it perfect. There's there is actually no opportunity to do that. Um, one of my one of my favorite stories to this day is 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 AAA and um, they stood on stage with us and told the story in, in I believe it was Boston at, at one of the conferences uh, around claims um, because they really wanted to change the experience within their claims and they had so many different systems which created so many different data outputs that they would have had to change a report and the export. So they couldn't get these calls and, and the automated SMS happening. And so what we were able to build for them was just uh, basically a repository that reformatted the data header and then was able to use um, the rest of our upload process and API. Um, and so I do, I do think that when you have a desire and it's an area that you know how to measure success and you have a baseline, don't wait for perfect to get started. Just make sure that you have all the right members of that story present. If you look at the journey the customer could possibly go through, um, knowing they can take many paths, and, and as long as you have all the stakeholders at the table, it's a great place to start, whether it's a specific product line or a specific number of states. Um, pick a test group and, and start that test and learn process. Um, it was just a fantastic opportunity for them. And once you understand the cost savings and you have a, that baseline, then you can justify if it makes sense to re-automate or maybe this new side automation is, is perfect for the next year and a half or whatever in, until a, another implementation is complete or what that means. So I think recognizing how fluid um, and yet how safe um, you can create an experience for your customers, um, it really is about the internal communication. I, I, one thing we haven't talked about um, yet and I think is really important, and I think we, we share this with Duck Creek is how important it is, is, is finding that customer satisfaction metric. Um, at Splice Software, we're NPS, uh, so Net Promoter Score Certified, and we also do customer stat surveys. Um, having that data going in is going to really help you. Um, having some sort of baseline on your overall process that you can compare against and recognizing that if you start at FNOL um, and then maybe don't fully automate payment, maybe that's part that you don't capture at the end and you know they still are waiting for a check in the mail or something, you might have a hard time if your only metric is my entire customer SAT uh, rating at the end of my claims experience. Right, because they are going to be reporting on the entirety of it. Um, and so it's really critical to look at first, do I have a baseline at where am I tracking my customer stat and how long will it take to measure this? Um, and so something like claims closure, you know, you're going to be able to measure that quite a bit faster. Um, but customer satisfaction or customer churn, um, how many people after a claim start shopping and when does that happen? Do they wait for renewal? Those are lagging metrics that are incredibly important to have significant ROI, um, but you're not going to be able to report on them in a 90-day period. And so being realistic and certainly uh, you know, I think both the Duck team and the Splice team can provide recommendations on where we've seen other carriers start, um, and, and, we, and we gave some of those examples, like the number of days to book the appointment possibly is one of them. Number of appointments kept with an adjuster is another one. Um, checks. Um, you know, that how fast we're closing that claim, how fast the customer is clearing, or number of times they've had to call inbound asking about their claim. That can be measured very quickly. Um, but things like, um, you know, propensity to shop and, and look for a new policy post-claim, um, no, that's going to take some, 
takes them much more time. And, and same thing with an overall customer satisfaction score. So um, the thing I really like to call out when we talk about implementation is just know where you are and you can start from wherever you are. Um, bring bring the right team. Um, wherever the customer can journey in that pilot, they need to be part of it. Um, and so it's sort of an easy way to figure out who needs to be involved. Um, pick things that you already report on. Getting IT time is really hard and really expensive. Uh, make and, and those things are going to set you up to start that test and test and learn mentality and um, it's exciting. It's really exciting to just really look at what are the manual processes that can be improved upon that actually drive satisfaction because um, there's a lot of low hanging fruit out there right now. Yeah, I mean, sounds like there's a lot to consider like from the customer for, to the underlying technology to what your partners and vendors can support especially as you iterate and build towards your end goal. Um, but to wrap up the conversation, there are a lot of great examples of ways carriers can automate and modernize their, their customer engagement, but all these options can be overwhelming. So, Tara, what advice do you have for carriers as they, as they decide to embark on this automation journey? Yeah, so my advice for carriers as you start this journey is definitely map out your current state. Find the report that you're the most embarrassed to share, right? <laughs> Whether that, you know, find an area that you say, wow, this part has to change. Um, where is in, the, in that customer journey is it really not performing well? Um, and then where can I easily report on it? And do I have, I think the, the last little nugget of where do I begin, find an area where we have a strong champion leader, um, a leader that truly is chosen by the people um, that are in that department that are going to rally behind them because test and learn sometimes is hard. We think we have to show up perfect. Uh, you need a strong champion that's going to be able to carry this forward, keep your eyes on the prize, um, and, and be ready to have a lot of fun um, because getting started is a powerful first step. Um, and the faster you start, the faster you'll learn and the better it'll get. Sasha, do you have any thoughts on where to get started? Uh, yeah, I think um, I think in addition to Tara, what you've already shared, just to echo what you said on on the last section here is is there's low low hanging fruit out there. So uh, find the place where you'll have cham champions, and find the places that for you uh, and for your uh, particular company are low hanging fruit. So we talked a lot about knowing how to measure success. A large aspect of success here is end user adoption. I've seen carriers implement um, self service FNOL and see no more than five percent end user adoption. And then, Tara, I'm sure you can share experiences of what what the photo submission for FNOL process looks like, but the adoption is uh, ridiculously higher on photo submission. So knowing knowing what the low hanging fruit would be within your organization, where there's traction with um, champions and where you can demonstrate results and measure them quickly and get them um, to the market, to your customers in an iterative manner. Um, I think just a few spaces to look at um, would be photo submission for FNOL, um, data enrichment overall. I'm seeing a lot of uptake in as well, uh, where you're reducing the amount of work a customer needs to do to get all their information submitted for a claim file by utilizing data enrichment services. Um, knowing your customers' communication preferences and being able to respond to those and toggle to those in an automated manner, um, that's critical. And communicating to your customer in their preferred manner, manner, having the tools to do that if you don't already have that technology in-house. Um, and exploring all the vendor options that are out there to support that so you don't have to build it yourself. So. Um, I'd say employ and harness the power of the technologies available in the vendors' uh, capabilities uh, in the market today um, and bring that to your customers in a way that's going to materially impact results and move, um, move metrics within your organization. That was so perfectly, perfectly said. I, I 
you're right, though. I can I can bring up some uh, examples of that. Photo submission has been shockingly popular. You're right, and and everybody that deploys it um, gets that responsiveness. And and when you talk about where do I begin as well, I, I love you know some of the examples we've seen is even though uh, you know we had an organization that wasn't ready to two way enable uh, their phone and uh, their text, and so the customers when they received a notification that said your phone you know your photos uh, aren't ac you know accurate enough or show enough, please resubmit they would just try to text back a picture. Well, well, that's very reasonable, right? But these guys weren't ready for, for two-way uh, on, the, on the system at that point, and um, they, they wanted them to just go back to the app to do it. And it was amazing to watch, you know, the number of people that would just text back a photo, and, and then you'd have to send back an auto text and say, sorry, we don't accept this, please go here. Um, and, and so that's a wonderful test alert opportunity. So maybe the roadmap didn't immediately have two-way SMS on it, but it, I think it's time to um, because your customers are asking for it. And so... Um, those things are all available today, and you know it's surprisingly easy. And I think that that is the the part that we're so excited about partnerships like Duck Creek and Splice and and partner ecosystems is that we can do these things. There's a lot of fantastic tools out there for you, and there's a lot of ways for you to try things without building it yourself and be able to recognize the value in a safe way for your customers, um, starting with preference and turning conversations um, into that into the standard um, versus blasting communication. So yeah, it's it's super exciting, Sasha. I think um, it's it's a great time for for carriers. Yeah, th th thanks, Sasha and Tara. I think you've both provided some great insights on how to maintain the balance between leveraging technology to drive automation and also providing the personal touch that customers need. Um, at this point, though, we'd like to start the Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder, please use the Ask a Question feature on your screen to submit questions. Um, so I've seen we've gotten a few already. Um, but So let's start with this first one from Tara. Uh, the question says, we've already automated communications to our, with our customers, but these are one-way communications. How do you go from just blasting out our message to customers to having back and forth conversations? That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, we touched on it a few different ways about, you know, what is a real conversation. The simple answer is really is just SMS enabling your phone numbers um, and being ready for the 24-hour responsiveness. So making decisions as an organization of when it's going to be managed by a bot and when are you going to be able to transfer out to an agent or a call center individual, customer service, whatever that looks like. Um, but this is actually something that's doable within literally a couple days um, is to transfer and to enable your line for two-way communication. You can even do it with phone numbers, outbound phone numbers, so businesses can text their customers on any line. It's not just a short code. And I think uh, further to that, it's really important to look at, you know, pick up your phone and look at your best relationships. You can call and text the person from that same phone number. And so really trying to bring conversations with a client into a single channel is going to truly encourage um, them to make that a, a real conversation. So whether that's on, you know, Facebook or WhatsApp, um, uh, or SMS native, uh, you have you have a great opportunity to just turn it into a two-way dialogue, and it's going to be awesome. And who knows, it could be voice first one day soon, where you're having a great conversation with your carrier in an automated way from your Alexa device um, on a fantastic new skill. So there is a lot of opportunity that technology can really go. Um, but the first step is just get that phone number enabled for two-way, um, and you watch those customers. They're going to be right there ready to talk to you because companies, People love to be able to text with companies. They really do. And we see so much data around that. Text messages are looked at within like 30 seconds, right? It's, they want to have that conversation. Thanks, Tara. Um, we've got another question, and it's for Sasha. So you mentioned how important it is to know your customer as automation is introduced into workflows. What is the role of customer and user experience research to maintain empathy and deliver what customers need? Yeah, I think user experience research overall is just very important to um, to focus on nowadays. Um, and we see different carriers put different levels of focus into that. Um, some carriers have hired, for example, chief design officers. Um, and at the C level are focusing on 
and differentiated user experience. So that plays out in a number of different ways. First of all, know your customer and the, and the, and the preferences that your customer has based on the type of book of business that you have. Um, I talked about some of those examples earlier where some customers are very responsive and, and needing that digital format of communication. And there are still some others out there that prefer a more, more traditional contact approach, perhaps in, in conjunction with uh, digital engagement as well. So knowing your customer is important, and also being able to design for, uh, for the persona that you recognize as your customer, and designing for the unique experiences that you want to be able uh, to enable throughout the, the life cycle of a claim, and more importantly, the life cycle of a customer. Um, those are important things to keep in mind as you bring any solution to bear uh, within claims and outside of claims for your customers. Great. Um, well, I think we're running out of time, so so thanks Sasha and Tara, and thank you all on the phone for your questions and participating in today's webinar. Uh, we still have a few questions in the queue, but unfortunately we're out of time. So if you submitted a question and we didn't get to it, we're going to respond to you shortly via email. As a, as a reminder, you're also going to receive a copy of the slides and access to the webinar recording. Again, thanks for joining us, and this now concludes today's webinar. Have a great rest of your day.